Welcome to this video tutorial on contingency tables. In this tutorial, I will present the workings to problem number two in problem set 5D in the textbook Applied Statistics. So the problem reads like this. A number of students were randomly selected from courses in computing, science and engineering, and then classified by gender. Is there an association between gender and course? And then the data is provided in the table. So in this case, the null hypothesis states that there is no association between gender and course. And the alternative hypothesis states that there is an association between gender and course. So to deal with this problem, I will first of all recreate that table. And I'll do so a good deal larger than it is at present because I will need some extra space for the calculations. So this can be computing, science and engineering, and this can be the male and female. So I've got male and female, computing, science and engineering, and into this table I will write these observed frequencies. Now I will leave some space because I'm going to be entering other numbers in the table as well. So there I've got 20 and 17 and 44. Down here I've got 19 and 45 and 4. Now these are the observed frequencies that I have just entered. They're observed because these are the data that we saw when we collected the data. So my first step is to calculate the marginal totals. So I'll add the, these three quantities to get the total number of males in the sample, and that's 81. Total number of females, adding these three numbers, is 68. Total number of computing students in the sample, adding these two numbers, is 39. Total number of science students, adding these two numbers, is 62. Total number of engineering students, adding these two numbers, is 48. And then the grand total, if I add 68 and 81, I get 149. And of course, I get the same result by adding these three numbers, 39, 62 and 48. That also gives 149. And it's a good check that I have done the addition correctly. Now, these numbers, the marginal totals uh, for the rows and the columns and the grand total, they do not form part of the table proper. The table consists of these two rows and three columns. Now, the next step is to calculate the numbers that I would expect to see in the table if the null hypothesis were true. That is, if there is no association between gender and course, how many males would I expect to see in computing? How many males would I expect to see in science? And so on. So we're going to compute next the expected frequencies. And the formula for expected frequency is row total times column total divided by grand total. So let me begin in this first cell here, first row and first column. If there is no association between gender and course, then looking in the margins, there are a total of 81 males out of 149 students. So the fraction of males overall is 81 over 149. If there's no association between gender and course, then that's the fraction of males we would expect to see in every course. So 81 over 149 of the 39 computing students would be expected to be male. So the formula I use is row total times column total divided by grand total. So when I'm in this cell, the row total is 81, the column total is 39, the grand total is 149. So 81 times 39 divided by 149 gives me 21.20. That's the expected number of males in computing if there's no association. The fact that it's not an integer means, of course, it couldn't happen in, in reality, but it is the expected number. And so it's not, um, it's not inappropriate to record a number there that's not an integer. Now, in science, we would expect 81 times 62 over 149 as the males in science. 81 times 62 over 149 gives us 33.70. 
That's the number of males you would expect to see in science if there was no association. Now, going to the next cell, <clears throat> I have a choice here. These numbers must add up to 81. So I could find the number in the next cell by adding these two entries together and then subtracting the result from 81 because that, would, that has to be the answer here. Although what I suggest to you is that we calculate this number in the usual way and then we can check if the, our answers are correct by adding them together and seeing if they sum to 81. So it's a good check on your calculations. Um, I, we could say that this last number in this row is not free because it's determined by the row total, which is 81. In the same way, we'll be able to find this number by subtraction if we so choose, the last number in every column, and this number. And we, when we already know this number, this number could also be found by subtraction. So the last entry in every <clears throat> column, therefore the last row on the table and the last column of the table are not free. And so the number of degrees of freedom is the remaining cells after you have ignored the last row and the last, last column. One, two. There are two degrees of freedom in this table. So I'll just write that over here because that will be useful to us and necessary later on. The number of degrees of freedom is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Or as I've just demonstrated, hide one row and hide one column and count the remaining cells. One, two is the number of degrees of freedom in a contingency table. Okay, so if I calculate in this cell, I get 81 times 48 over 149, and that becomes 26.09. I've just done that on my calculator beforehand. Let me check that these add up to 81. 9, 9, it adds up to 80.9. So in fact, it, it does add up to 81 with some rounding that accumulated across the cell. So there's a small learning error. So that, that is correct. My calculations are correct there. Again, let me calculate in this cell. I don't need to. I could subtract, but I recommend to you that we calculate 39 times 68 over 149 is 17.80. In this cell, 62 times 68 over 149. That is the, the row total for the row that we're in times the column total for the column that we're in divided by the grand total. And that gives 28.30. And in this final cell, 68 times 48 over 149 gives 21.91. Let me check. Uh, adding these together gives a one, uh, yeah, like 68.1, it seems like. Uh, so again, it's close enough that everything seems good. We can also check in this direction. Uh, that adds up to 39. These two do add up to 62 and these do add up to 48. So everything's good there. OK, we have got the um, observed frequencies, 20 and so on. We've got the expected frequencies. The question now arises, is there a big difference between the observed and the expected frequencies? So we're now going to calculate chi-square. And in every cell, there is a chi-square contribution. And the chi-square contribution is O minus E to be squared divided by E. So in the first cell, O is 20, minus E is 21.2, subtracting at minus 1.2, minus 1.2 squared, and then divided by 21.2 is 0 0.07. I'm writing in a different colour just to highlight the fact that the first number is the observed frequency, the second number is the expected frequency, and the third number in every cell is the chi-square contribution from that cell. How do I get that number? 20 minus 21.2 is minus 1.2. Square that number and then divide it by 21.2. O minus E to be squared divided by E. In the second cell, 17 minus 33.7, that quantity squared and divided by 33.7 is 8.28. In the next cell, 44 minus 26.09. Get the result and square it, and then divide it by 26.09. It gives me 12.29. Here in this cell, 19 minus 17.8 is uh, 
1.2 squared divided by 17.8 is 0 0.08. In this cell, 45 minus 28.3 to be squared and then divided by 28.3 is 9.85. And in the last cell, in case I haven't made it plain enough, I take O4 minus 21.91. Uh, uh, I think I've made a mistake there, so I'll just go again. 4 minus 21.91 is 7 minus 17.91. I'm going to square that quantity is 320.7681 and divided by 21.91. 21.91 gives me 14.64. 14.64. Okay, so I now have a chi-square contribution entered in every cell. So the next step is to add together all of these chi-square contributions, all of these numbers I've displayed in red. I simply add them all together. And that's the chi-square value. Chi-square looks like x, but the crossbar is more bent. x squared, or not x squared, but chi-square, equals the sum of all the these numbers. 0 0 0 0.07 plus 8.28 plus 12.29 plus 0 0.08 plus 9.85 plus 14.64. And that comes to 45.21. 45.21. Is the calculated value of chi-square. Now we've taken all these numbers and reduced it all to a single number. This number will tell us if there's association or not. Is that number critical? Is it in the rejection region? Does it have a p-value less than 5%? We know we have two degrees of freedom so we'll go to the tables of the chi-square distribution which you can find in the back of the textbook or in any statistical tables. Tables of the chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom, as we said, and the upper 5% point. And the critical value is 5.991. 5.991. So 5.991 is the critical value of chi-square with two degrees of freedom. 5.991. Now, obviously, 45.21 is much greater than 5.991. So we reject the null hypothesis. It is unlikely that we would have found such a big difference between the observed and the expected frequencies if there was no association between gender and course. So we can say that we reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis said there is no association between gender and course. We are rejecting the null hypothesis so we are saying there is an association between gender and course. Now, we can say more than that. We can explain this a bit better. Uh, there's an association between gender and course. That means that the proportions of male students in the courses is different. It's not the same in every course, or female students, whichever way we want to tell it. Now, let's let's go back and look at the chi-square contributions to help us to tell this story. We said there are two degrees of freedom, so there may be two things for us to draw to the attention of the reader of our, of our answer here. Let's go to the biggest chi-square contribution. It's here in this cell. 14.64 is the biggest contribution. Now, 14.64 is in this cell. It's the female students in engineering. There were only four where we expected almost 22. So we expected a large number of female students in engineering, but we found much fewer. So when we said there's an association between gender and course, the big part of the story is there are fewer female students than expected in engineering. We are not saying there are fewer females than males in engineering. That's not the point we're making. In fact, overall, there are fewer females than males in our sample. So that's not the story we're, we're, we're making. We're making this story. There are fewer females than expected in engineering. We began this study expecting to see the proportions of female students equal or almost equal in all the courses. 
we found that that's not the case. And in particular, there are fewer female students than expected in engineering. So let's say that, uh, fewer female students than expected in engineering. Because there's two degrees of freedom, perhaps it could tell another part of the story. Let's go to the next biggest chi-square contribution. There it is. It's the males in engineering. Well, that's not a new piece of information. We already know more females than expected in engineering, so it's automatic that there's more males than expected in engineering. So let's go somewhere else. Here's the next biggest contribution. In science, uh, that's the next biggest chi-square contribution. In science, we had 45 female students in science, where we expect only 28. So there are more female students than expected in science. So let's say that. Fewer female students than expected in engineering and more female students than expected in science. You could elaborate on that conclusion, you know, with it a longer narrative to explain this to your client or the person who's interested in finding out about this. So we have found that having carried out the contingency table test, there is contingency, there is association, there is dependence of gender on course. The proportions of a gender is not the same in the different courses. Certain courses have a higher proportion of one gender than expected. Because we would expect, having seen these marginal totals, that these fractions would apply in all courses, but that's not so. Engineering has fewer females than expected. Science has more females than expected. So that's one example of a contingency table. And in problems 5D in the textbook, you can find lots of other problems that you can try on contingency tables.